Welcome to the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your weekly overview of precious metals and market updates. I'm your host, J.D. Bauman, and I'm here with my brother, Joel. Thanks for tuning in. Joel, great to see you. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, J.D. How was your trip to Austin, Austin, Texas? It was great. I've never been in Austin before. So oh, really? I was, yeah, happy to be in Texas. And it felt like a wonderful mix between suburban Florida and, and West Coast or be, being in the West. So not yet taken over by those Silicon Valley types yet. So did you, um, did you see Tent City when you were there? I did not. What is this? Under, uh, I forget the highway, but there's like this multi-mile stretch of just uh, homeless people living in tents. It, it's it's kind of like the whole Seattle, San Francisco, like the media doesn't really cover it, but there's there's a pretty big mm. homeless problem. So it is like Silicon Valley. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's jump into it. So listeners, we are going to briefly touch on the news, but really the, the meat of this episode is in our interview with Dr. Charles mm. Steele. He's the head of economics professor at Hillsdale College. And we get into the weeds with him about debt, about energy policy, about Austrian economics. So stay tuned for that. But Joel, why don't we start out here with just some market news? Yeah, let's do it. So gold this week is trading at $2,392 per ounce. It's up about $57 since this time last week. Silver is up about 3% since this time last week. It's at 2866 the dollar index is at 106.12, and the VIX, the fear gauge, is at 18.71. Some big news this week. There was last Saturday the Iranian strike against Israel. They launched about 300 missiles, and Israel allegedly retaliated. It was last night, right? In terms, It was today Israeli time, but it was last night uh, okay. New York time. I see. Well, anyways, VIX is up on the news. So the, the big monetary news this week is Jerome Powell's announcement Tuesday. So Jerome... Powell actually admitted that there hasn't been any further progress this year on inflation. So interest rates aren't going to be cut anytime soon, investors expect. Stocks are down on the news, down 3% on the week. And New York manufacturing data came out. This is the fifth straight month of contraction with manufacturing. So no surprise there, but um, never good to see. I'll pass it off to you, Joel. What what are you seeing on the technical side before we jump into this interview? Yeah, I'll keep it short. Um, I was keen to point this out last week, but... We ran into a little bit of resistance and we're getting liquidity in on both gold and silver. A lot of profit taking at the short term swing high of $30 on silver and then gold 2430. We're going back into that consolatory, you know, tight range bound action that we were getting earlier in this year, like January, early February. That is just coiling for the next move. So this isn't at all a bearish signal. In fact, fundamentals are still very strong. And gold and silver between just the commercial buying, between central banks buying, and then what we're seeing just anecdotally in order flow, uh, this this rally definitely is going to keep going. So just keep a lookout for increases of premiums, and then product delays are going to start going up. Um, but that I'll, I'll cover more on that in a couple of weeks to come. Are you expecting premiums to increase in the in the future? Premiums on bullion bars have not haven't moved up at all yet, at least from what I'm looking at. The coins are starting to tick up on eagles and a little bit on the maple leaves, but no, you haven't missed the boat yet. And until silver gets above thirty, the party hasn't really started because once we're in the thirty plus handle, it's going to be a short stop to fifty. So really, uh, if anyone is on the sidelines, it's by no means is it too late. Sounds good. Well. So let's jump in now to our conversation with Dr. Steele. And Joel, I'd love to unpack that after the interview. Sounds good. Dr. Steele, thank you so much for coming on. I'm very happy to be here. So for those who are listening who don't know you, how would you introduce yourself? Well, I am Associate Professor of Economics at Hillsdale College. I am currently the chair of the Department for Economics, Business, and Accounting. Uh, My term is about to expire on that but I'm also director of Hillsdale College's new Center for Commerce and Freedom. Besides that, I do a bunch of running, I guess. PhD from New York University, where I studied with Israel Kirzner, famous Austrian economist, student of Ludwig von Mises. Did quite a lot of work there. And for those who are maybe a bit less familiar about Hillsdale College, how do you describe Hillsdale? So Hillsdale College is a very distinctive place. First of all, to me, one of the most important things is that we don't take any government funding. 
not any government funding of any kind, not federal, not state, not local. That way we, we maintain our independence. Nobody can tell us what we're going to do. We actually can teach what we believe is right instead of being having other people decide for us that we have to check certain boxes. Another thing about the school is that we have a traditional liberal arts core. We take that very seriously. All students take a course in the U.S. Constitution. We take that very seriously. And we have a very strong, I mean, a very strong economics program for undergraduate at the undergraduate level. Walter Williams once uh, was on the radio and was asked this question, what's the best place for an undergraduate to study economics? And he said, you might think I'm going to say my college, but it's not. It's Hillsdale College. That's a good segue into our next topic of conversation. The U.S. national debt for student loan debt actually is almost $2 trillion. And just all around me, it seems like there are more government programs going on where nearing $35 trillion in national debt. How long can we keep going into debt? And what's your take on what's happening in the macro economy right now? <laughs> well, this certainly took a, a depressing turn. <laughs> it's truly a serious problem. It's an interesting question. How long can that can be kicked down the road? I don't have a crystal ball that will tell. That, uh, e- economics can't really predict such things. We can make pre- conditional predictions but so much depends on what politicians decide and and other factors that are so numerous that you can't figure them all in. First, it's a really serious problem because we're at the point now where we are we have such a large national debt compared to our GDP that it becomes unsustainable at some point. Current interest payments on national debt now exceeds our national defense spending. That may be so. I haven't looked at the latest uh, numbers on those. But it's uh, the, here's the real danger is that if interest rates go up, then you're refinancing this debt at higher and higher rates, and it explodes like crazy. It becomes the biggest part of government spending. The debt that we have and this, this course for adding to it is really not sustainable. And, of course, the biggest problem with the debt in trying to fi- fix these, uh, this growing debt is the entitlement programs, as they're called. So that Social Security and Medicare in particular and Medicaid, that's not called discretionary spending, which simply means that Congress is already committed to it uh, long term. But we have we have burdens that are absolutely not payable. And at some point, there will have to be cuts in those programs one way or another. It's not a question of do we want that or should we or anything else. I'm talking about what is just inevitable, that we have unsustainable debt. One of our values here at Shift Gold is helping people switch out of paper money, the dollar, into real money, physical gold and silver. Does this make you bullish on gold or in other currencies? Or how would you describe your, your monetary outlook of really what, what other alternatives are there right now with, with so much debt and, and so much depreciation of the dollar? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm not an investment advisor and I don't even, you know, n- normally an investment advisor will still have disclaimers, but I'm not even an investment advisor. And so anything I would say about what people might think about doing is is totally personal opinion and speculative. So I tend not to do that. I think that gold, of course, is is particularly important as a kind of a last resort, sort of a hedge against uh, the destruction of a currency. Well, I think you should buy gold simply because Schiff Gold is a good outfit and they need your business. (laughs) I like Peter Schiff. What do you know about Peter Schiff? Why do you why do you like Peter? Well, first of all, I think he's uh, he's quite insightful on on the economy. I think he knows his stuff. I saw there was a video that I used to show in class when we were talking about the Austrian school, and in two thousand six, he was on one of the I don't even remember which network, but he was on one of the network investment shows. And he was, um, other participants were some of their regular guests, but also Art Laffer. And they were asking everyone what they, it was 2006, what do you forecast for for the U.S. economy? And everyone was saying it was the, you know, smooth sailing for the indefinite future. The economy had never been stronger, according to Art Laffer. He said, we have the strongest economy. It's, uh, you know, excellent, excellent, you know, policy on, in, on, in all respects. And Peter Schiff then was the only one who said, this is all a house of cards. 
it's fake. The real estate boom in particular has been fake. And then it's uh, accelerated by the, uh, you know, by all of the derivatives and things that were built on it. And he said, it's going to, he said, it's all just paper. It's all just fiction and it's going to blow up. And they laughed at him. They mocked him. This is the point at which Art Laffer bet him one penny that he was wrong. But Laffer said, I've never, where would you ever get ideas like this? And I know where Schiff got the ideas. He got them from Ludwig von Mises and from Friedrich Hayek from the Austrian school who had laid out this theory of the business cycle, which turns out to be basically correct. Schiff was right on target with it. In 2008 and afterwards, I would play that video for my Austrian economics class and we would see, you know, here's here's Art Laffer versus Peter Schiff. And which one turns out to be right is Schiff because he's using the ideas from the Austrian school. So, Dr. Seal, you're trained in the Austrian school. You studied under Kirstner, who studied under Mises. You know Mises' works in and out. What does the Austrian school have to say about the situation we're in right now and, and what's going to happen next, right? With debt piling up, with the Fed having created so much inflation with, with the government on a spending spree, what do you see coming next Yes. It's one of the interesting things is that Mises himself points out that it's possible to, in some way, kick the can down the road, so to speak, for quite a long time. And you can't say that, well, we're just about, you can't predict, an economist cannot predict that, as he calls it, a crack up boom will come imminently. Um, There are too many factors that are not predictable. But the long run story is that you have unsustainable debt and it, it will blow up. Now, I think there are a couple of scenarios that could happen, um, but of course, it depends so much on what happens with China and you know, the world situation there. Just given the amount of debt that we have and the way it is mounting, at some point, there will be a combination of inflating it away, that is, pay, in, expanding the money supply, supply to uh, pay off debt. And another thing is uh, default, too. So I think you see an increase in taxes. I think you'll see an increase in inflation. And I think a certain amount of default, although they probably won't call it that. Uh, but any time that you're restructuring debt so that people aren't making, aren't getting what they thought they were going to get, that's a default. You will also see a restructuring. They will, they will find some way to reduce Social Security benefits, reduce Medicare and things like that, simply because they have to. But there will be some sort of camouflage. So they're saying that's not really what we're doing. This made me think of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is really just a massive spending spree for green energy right. projects. So, uh, and this is a, an issue that you've done research in and consulting for. What, what do you think listeners need to know about what's happening with U.S. regulation, including around energy? Right. I think that's actually an extremely serious problem uh, because it potentially shuts down the economy. If you don't have energy, you, you don't have a, a functioning economy. And the things that are being proposed and that are being implemented are not functional. So, for example, the Inflation Reduction Act is much more than um, Department of Energy. The Department of Agriculture, for example, is involved in it. And just as an example of the kind of thing that is going on, there is there is a um, ethanol plant in uh, Ohio. They process soybeans, turn them into ethanol, which, of course, is another government boondoggle because the ethanol is, is primarily used for as a fuel additive. And that's, of course, subsidized, mandated and subsidized. But when farmers bring their soybeans in, they're required at this plant to show what the carbon footprint per bushel is. If the carbon footprint is too high, they are turned away. They don't purchase it. If the carbon footprint is particularly low, they get a premium for it. So what the plant is now doing under federal instructions is purchasing carbon footprint, not soybeans. The soybeans are the same otherwise. So, so the issue here isn't that people care about the, the environment. The issue here is that we're creating these poorly planned, essentially planned provisions that create rent seeking and are actually disincentivizing better energy production. These things do very, they, these things do nothing really for the environment. Uh, they are basically boondoggles and, and handouts in various ways. Um, and much of it is for supporting, for, for gaining the support of the environmental lobbies that 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 are supporting the you know, the Biden administration and the Democrats. And of course other policies there's a there's a the Biden administration has announced a moratorium 
on expansion of nat liquid natural gas exports. And the United States is the largest producer of, of natural gas. That's actually a very clean fuel. Uh, but the Biden administration is basically making war on, on, on gas production. And that's a really dangerous thing. Um, we've got lots of, uh, we've got excellent um, energy sources in this country, but we're shutting them down and switching to things that don't work. Wind and solar mostly do not work. They're not scalable. They can't be used at the level that would be needed to replace coal, natural gas, and for that matter, nuclear. Let's transition to talk a little bit more about some other issues that you're passionate about or researching right now, and that, that's in the area of of space economics and AI and how AI is going to shape the economy. P part of the justification for fire stock prices by some has been, oh, we have the, the seven or eight AI stocks that are carrying the economy. And the, the optimists are saying, oh, well, we're just we're going to have structurally higher growth in the future because of these seven or eight stocks, you know, while, while the rest are trailing. Do you buy this story? Do you, do you think that AI is, is creating structural improvements that, that will that will carry the rest of the economy forward? So I'm less an expert on, I'm, I'm not an expert on AI, but I do know a bit about it. I'm fairly bullish on on the potential of AI, if it's used correctly. Yeah, I think that it actually does have a kind of a structural effect on the economy. It makes so many things so much more easy and effective. Space economy is also, I think, really interesting. That's a, that's a, a, a real interest of mine. Development of outer space has the potential to revolutionize, I think, our economy. There's so much that can be done. The potential for manufacturing in space is enormous. The real problem with space, two, two, two problems actually, but the, the fundamental problem with the space economy is getting there. There's so much that can be done, but it's expensive to get out of Earth's gravity wells. The space shuttle, for example, it cost $65,000 to lift one kilogram, that's 2.2 pounds, into low Earth orbit. Elon Musk has that down below $1,500, and it is likely that they're going to get, that he and others will get that cost down below $100 a kilogram. Once space is accessible, there's so much stuff you can do there in microgravity and in the, uh, you know, in the uh, vacuum. Uh, you basically have a vacuum there. Uh, 3D printing of, of human organs. They've experimented with this already. Uh, can, you can imagine that someone needs a, needs a transplant or something. It's potentially possible to take someone's own cells, print an organ in space, and then transplant it into them. You don't have the rejection problems then. And the problem with doing that on Earth is that you have gravity. So you, you need to be able to make uh, one cell thick layers but you try that on Earth and they collapse and everything gets mushed together, but you can do it in space. And it, it, uh, it's, they've already experimented with this. There's a private company in Ohio that has had a project on the International Space Station, and they've been s successful in getting some of the first 3D printing of or organs done. Just the amount of potential is fabulous. We're talking trillions of dollars of benefits that could be done. And it gets away from many of the questions that people have about pollution and things like this as well. So as we wrap up here, if folks listening are interested in learning more about Austrian economics, where would you recommend they, they look? What, what books, what top two or three books would you recommend they read? And any other, any other resources you, you think would be best for, for listeners who want to dig deeper in Austrian economics? Sure. I'm very much partial to the work of Ludwig von Mises and his most important book is Human Action. It's a full account of, of uh, economics. It's not an easy book either. And many people read it and, and have, have difficulty understanding what he's talking about. A really good place to start in economics is Thomas Sowell's book, Basic Economics. And Sowell isn't usually considered an Austrian. But as I read his book, I realize that for most of what he does, he has a very Austrian perspective on it. The one place where he doesn't is where he treats money in a very uh, aggregate way. But and it's a good start. We'll, we'll give so a break on that one uh, because then we can pick up, you can pick up Theory of Money and Credit by Mises. You can pick up some of the works of Friedrich Hayek. Um, those are excellent. If a person is interested in the theories of entrepreneurship, Israel Kirzner is my, my dissertation advisor, 
is one of the best writers on that subject. He's got quite a number of works out. Mises is a great place to start. Excellent. Well, and um, I should mention, you're always welcome. <laughs> I mean, get a thousand people to show up, but come to my classes at Hillsdale College. Excellent. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Steele. Uh, thanks so much for, for sharing your insights. And, and th thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. One thing I didn't mention, actually, at the start of the episode is that I studied at Hillsdale College and, and Dr. Mm. Steele was the, the head of the department when I was there and I took as many classes with him as I, as I could. So this was a special treat for me. Yeah, he was um, really humble, well-spoken. He knew his stuff. Did you take him for just one or two classes or was he a pretty dominant professor for you? I took about five classes with okay. Dr. Steele and I learned Austrian economics from him, read human action, read various other Austrian thinkers and was consistently impressed by the, the rigor of those thinkers and how timeless they are, right? So their insights have so much to say today, although they don't provide the kind of answers people are looking for today, right? People ask, sure. when are we going to see a market correction? When are we going to see, like, exactly when are we going to see the collapse of the dollar? And these authors weren't interested in giving us precise timetables. Rather, they were interested in giving us sound theory. And I think that's a bit of what we got from Dr. Steele. And I'm curious if you have thoughts on that and if there are any highlights for you. Yeah, it's it's not information. And, and Peter kind of falls in this camp too, where there's a lot of things that you can hear. It's not something you could just run to your trade station or sign into Charles Schwab and start day trading on this information. But principally speaking, like Peter says it all the time. He's like, I, I want to have the last laugh. I want to be able to keep my principle, you know, the return of principle, more importantly than the return on principle which is the idea of the preservation and just principally keeping your capital. And speaking of capital, that's also another interesting uh, Austrian economic take where the damage is done in the boom cycle of the boom bust uh, business cycle, where you have all the malinvestment pouring into industries that otherwise would have no position unless the government tilted and you know subsidized different kind of green movements or mandated certain um, carbon emissions. It's just like things in a completely free market economy would never have legs or stand a chance. It's diverting an immense amount of capital, time, energy, and I, I like that he brought that up. And he, he even he brought up like things like ethanol, which um, I know that other economists like Keith Weiner they refer to as you know borderline these useless ingredients that just aren't really adding value to the consumer. But <laughs> we kind of play this carbon game because we're we're all trying to be the good boys. Right. And I think this is why he made that transition to green energy, just because there's been so much pass in that area. The so-called Inflation Reduction Act was basically a, a green stimulus yeah. package, and if you subscribe to Austrian theory and think that these things are mispriced, that, that's a hundred billion dollar plus bill of malinvestment, which we're going to pay for. I think you call them boondoggles and handouts, and it's and that's that's going to get purged out eventually. One thing I really appreciated at the end, though, as we close here, is that while there's a lot of pessimism about the state of the economy, the state of governance and government meddling, there's a lot of optimism about the market and about really human innovation, human potential, right? Uh, the story of economics is not the story of, of power and who's controlling power, but it's a story of cooperation and innovation of, of people working together to build bigger and better things. And I think that's also why he made that pivot to talk about mm. space economics at the end, which is an area of research of his. Uh, and as far uh, flung as it sounds, 3D printed human organs, like, yeah, it took a left turn there. I, uh, it sounds super cool. I just, I, it's outside my wheelhouse. I, at the end of the day, it's companies were built on missions that somebody had the idea to improve quality of life or make things better. And then they just, they built a structure or a company around it. And then they used the hidden forces of economics to make that happen. And so that's, yeah, that was well said. Yeah, if I had a son or daughter and they were going to school, I'd probably uh, echo Walter Williams' um, recommendation and tell, send them to Hillsdale. So. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for listening. If you have ideas on future podcast guests, we can't guarantee we'll get them on, but we will have a look and send invites out. So please comment wherever you're listening, and we'll take a look. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week.